So the first thing is the project need. I know people were asking about why we needed this project. The ISO, which is the independent system operator for New England, which handles our transmission load, back in 2010 had a study done on the transmission system within the greater Boston area and found some deficiencies. This study was then reevaluated in 2013 and 2014. National Grid and Eversource teamed up and basically supplied a set of solutions for this um, this need that was that was identified by ISO for the to bulk up the transmission system in the greater Boston area. Some of those projects are joint projects like this one where we are working with Eversource to construct it and there's also other projects that are independent that either National Grid is just doing or Eversource is doing. We're here specifically to talk about the one that we're doing jointly here in um, that runs from Woburn, Winchester, Stoneham, and Wakefield. Specifically, though, we're going to talk just about Wakefield. So the first thing I want to address is I understand that Wakefield is a municipality, so your electric bill is, is sent to you by Wakefield, not National Grid. However, National Grid supplies the energy and the electricity to Wakefield, and then they distribute it to you. So this, does, this project is needed by Wakefield. Again, reliability, give you guys a backup as well should something happen on another line. It's a little tough to see, and I apologize for that, but there's a yellow line, and this is the pr uh, proposed route for that underground line that will be connecting the Eversource Woburn Station here to the National Grid Wakefield Junction, Junction Station up there. Here we have just the Wakefield portion. So you can see it starts on Albion, goes up to Broadway, North Avenue, Main Street, and then that green portion right in the middle is that MBTA right-of-way, and then we go back up to Salem Street and then Montrose Avenue, ending at the substation. So a lot of questions about how we, became, how we determined these routes were asked. There's 16 criteria that are used to score a potential route for an underground line. Here are your 16 criteria. So you'll see residential land use, um, public shade trees, the utility density, is it actually constructible, what's underneath that pavement, you know, is that a, a substrate that's going to be able to support an underground line or is it something that's mostly maybe sand or something that would require, you know, that, that's not going to hold and be steady? Uh, is it known for flooding? Things like that are all put into a scoring system. Uh, and then we also do historical research. We do uh, traffic research, high impact, uh, environmental sensitivities, wetlands, uh, endangered species. I think there's, yeah, Dave Clinch was part of that and he's here and he can speak more to that after the presentation if you have more questions. But those are all, you know, things that come into and we've, I, we identified over 30 different routes for this underground cable and then went through the scoring processes as well as meeting with your town leadership, the DPW director, the um, municipal light director, um, and speaking to them and bringing them into the process as well. So that's kind of an overview of all those different colors were all different routes that we looked at. Not all of them because you wouldn't be able to pick any of them out, but here's a good example on some of the routes that were looked at. So one of the things that we're doing once we've gotten kind of to that point where we have a few routes in our pocket to look at that are actually viable, we start our outreach program. And that outreach program you can see started back in 2014. Um, there have been hiccups. I'm not going to say that everything is perfect, but we have tried to rectify any, any hiccups that we have had. We've been out there, we've talked to, you know, community members through the door-to-door -door at our open houses, which were very well attended. 
the mailings. So one of the things I will ask again is that if you see something in your mailbox that says National Grid, open it. It's, it's from us. We're, we're trying to reach you. We've also uh, coordinated now with the town and we'll be posting any updates. We'll coordinate with them so that the updates also get posted on the town website and the town Facebook page. So there's multiple ways. We've also, um, tonight as you signed in, we asked if you wanted to give your email so that you can opt into a, an e-newsletter that we will be creating and then mailing out, uh, emailing to people. So um, again, multiple facets of, of communication. So anything that you want, you can, uh, you can easily access for, from us. So the door-to-door -door outreach started in 2015. And you can see um, kind of what we have done regarding door-to-door -door up through uh, this summer. Uh, future outreach plans. We will be holding another open house like this in January, the date will be determined, and that'll be for people that maybe could not make it tonight. Um, we will then also hold a construction-focused open house. So that'll be not having a presentation. It will just be boards, like you saw earlier this evening. It'll just be focused on the construction process, what you should be expecting once we actually start breaking ground. Um, this, is, this is so that you're not shocked by any of the equipment. It's large equipment. Um, the trucks are big, so we want you to know what, what's coming down the road. We will also continue, like I said, the e-newsletter will continue to reach out via the mail and then also those postings that we'll work with the town to share via Facebook and the town website. Permitting. It's a big portion of the project. Um, we did both, this project needed both local and state permitting. So we started off with um, our permits that we received from the Mass Department of Transportation. We also went to the uh, Conservation Commission and we, um, we got our permits from them. We also then are doing our grants of location, which is pending, as all of you know. And then we are working on the getting property rights for the MBTA right of way, which is uh, another portion of the underground line that was highlighted in green earlier. The Energy Facilities Siting Board. They are charged with reviewing all of our electric transmission projects and the need for those projects, the impacts, the cost, and then if is this project really needed? So we filed in September 2015 for this project. There was a public hearing in November. There was a certain time period once we filed that you could file as an intervener. That's done so that the EFSB can gather all of the information, questions, reasons why people or groups might intervene in a project, why they don't want the project. We then have to answer all of these inquiries that are sent to the EFSB, and there were over 600 of them, and we have to answer them within short time periods and provide expert uh, analysis, question, uh, answers. Um, and then they held 13 days of hearings on the project. Uh, after that, uh, there's initial briefs, we reply to them, and then we wait until they make a decision, which should be, I believe, January? January, February of 2018. It's a very long, very detailed, process. This is what you can expect during construction. Um, I have some notes. So it's, again, it's like an assembly line like you see, and it would, each step is followed by the next step on the street, and they move roughly about 50 to 100 feet a day, roughly about that much. So your street or a street that's being worked on would be impacted for about a week or two, roughly, given give or take weather or, or an event. Um, right after we're done with what we've done and we do the temporary paving, that temporary paving stays for a while before we do the curb to curb, and that's to allow things to settle 
just like when you build a house and you allow that house to kind of settle a bit before you go and paint walls so that you don't see kind of crooked lines or anything like that. It's the same idea. We want that to settle and to stay stable so that then when we go back and we curb, pave, to, uh, pave curb to curb, it's nice and smooth and it comes and there's no repair work needed for that. couple more pictures of what this looks like when, um, as you can see, the cable rail truck is pretty big. And then that's your, your very typical trenching operation to lay the cable. The substation. So, sorry, to support this 345 kV line to give the reliability that's needed, we have to add some equipment to the substation that's currently in Wakefield. And all the work will be entailed and enclosed in that substation. And then what we're doing is we will um, we'll also be expanding the sound wall that's currently at the substation. Um, anyone who has questions about the substation and the substation work, we do have our substation engineer here, and that would be Dan, right over there. He's an expert at substations. It's very good. And now we have some of the benefits that uh, for the town of Wakefield, again, the curb to curb paving for all of the impacted streets, the replacement of 4,200 feet of existing steel gas line on Salem Street. So we'll, we'll be replacing that at our cost. Um, again, we'll be clearing and cleaning up and the paving of that unused MBT right-of-way, which um, will then be, then can be used by the, by the town for a, um, a rail trail if they so choose to use that. Um, again, property tax that we'll be paying on the line and also the reliability improvements for the town of Wakefield. We were asked to also discuss another town's experience with having a 345 KV line installed in their streets. And we recently completed a project in, oh, it's 115, I'm sorry, 115 KV. Um, we recently did complete a project in Salem, Massachusetts, which everybody knows is an extremely historical town. They have a very, um, very busy season during Halloween for all of their um, tourists and the witches and, and all of their events. So digging up these historical streets was a major concern to the town, to the residents, having their businesses interrupted um, you know, during construction. Would people know they were still open? And we worked with the town very closely. We worked with these businesses and it went off very well. We received applause from the town and from the people that lived there. The businesses were, were actually very happy with how we worked. We created signs for them. We made sure that people knew they were open. We had an e-newsletter. We met with them. Um, Darren, who is one of my team members, was actually in charge of all of that. It pretty much went where when we were done, the actual town manager said the town looked awesome. They were immensely pleased with our efforts with our work and with the uh, collaboration between ourselves, the residents, and the businesses over in Salem. So as I promised, pretty quick. Um, and I will open it up to questions. Yes, sir. The Salem, so the Salem line, the underground line, was 115 kV. When in Massachusetts did National Grid, have you ever done a project of this magnitude of the 345 kilovolt underground cable? Have you ever done it before? <clears throat> has it been done? Uh, yes. so, the, so the question is, have we done a 345 kV underground project? Over the years, um, the construction 
from one voltage versus another at this level is not is not dramatically different. So yes, we we did the Salem project. We've done several underground lines in Quincy. Uh, we completed one in Worcester that was about four miles long. So we, we have done this type of construction before. Okay, thank you for that. On the Providence line, how many years ago was that? That was, actually, that was actually 20 years ago. 20 years ago. I was a much younger engineer then. <laughs> All were, all were. <laughs> yeah. uh, so 325 kilovolt Providence 20 years ago. Since that time, what has been the protocol for measuring EMF in Providence? Uh, so sometimes we're asked to do a post-construction magnetic field survey. And we have we have done that on some jobs. We, we did that in the in the case of the Salem cables most recently. Um, what we also offer is if, if anyone wants magnetic field readings taken at their house before construction or after construction, we're, we're willing to do that and we encourage people to sign up if they want that kind of thing done. Great. Now, I just want to clarify, you do not do an ongoing EMF uh, monitoring program. It's ad hoc upon request. Yes, that's true. Okay. In Providence, there has been no EMF measuring going on, as far as you know, in the last 20 years. There, there may have, there may be one-offs on EMF measuring, where if a homeowner calls us and says, oh, you know, I'm having flickering or there's something going on or, you know, for whatever reason, and they say, I want to have an EMF appointment, we, we automatically do it, but it's not, it's not an ongoing monitoring. It's, it's a one-off appointment. Understood. I just want to make sure that National Grid does not do ongoing EMF monitoring. That's all I want to make sure. It's not part of your protocol. It's not part of your program. You don't put in sensors and stations to just monitor. That's all I want to that, Is that correct? Correct. correct. Any questions? Yes, sir. Uh, so you said there was roughly 5,100 feet a day for the trenching operation. Is that consistent with <coughs> that including replacing the piping that we're planning on doing on Zen? That's, that's going to have to happen as a separate operation. So what, what typically happens, I don't know if we can scroll back yep. to, to the construction spread. Yeah. Yep. Uh, this, this, you know, this is how we install the conduit system for the for the cables. The the, the pipe replacement for the gas line is going to be a similar kind of operation, but that that will probably move a little quicker because it's a simpler system to put in. But so we well, in the same uh, probably not. We're, we're, we have to site this new line where it'll fit between utilities. Um, and, and we also have to try to leave as much of the road available for traffic maintenance. So, you know, with, with that replacement, um, there, there's probably going to be two separate disturbances of Salem Street, one for the gas and one for the electric. And then when we're done, we'll come through with a, a final curve and curve payment for the whole street. So who's, who's responsible for the design on the gas portion? <clears throat> we're, we're working with the, the town of uh, Wakefield Gas Department. And, and the issue they have is they're, they're apparently already having some problems with this gas main and we're doing the replacement basically to, to help the, the town with a known problem. He's just jumping on the I'm not speaking out of the No, that's fine. I'm, I'm, uh, my name is David Polson. I'm um, with the light department. And that area where they're working is uh, approximately a mile long. It's, uh, in close proximity to the gas main, and that's a steel gas main, and, and it has a, uh, some leaks in it now, and we anticipate due to the proximity that it's going to create more leaks. So they've agreed to uh, uh, replace the services and the gas main along the route and uh, with plastic pipe. So at the end, you know, the uh, street will be repaved, we'll have new gas, and you know, nothing's better than you know, uh, having a new street and not having to uh, come back and dig it up again to repair a gas main. So we, we think this is a win-win for everybody by replacing the gas main at the same time. So how much will that add to the duration of the project? Um, yeah, I don't know if we've actually scoped that out, but uh, 
we're, we're planning to do the conduit installation, assuming that the permits come through starting in the spring of 2018 and going through 2018 and, and finishing up in, we, we won't be able to do the trench work in the winter between 2018 and 2019, so maybe finishing up some of the conduit work then, and most of the cable work will occur in 2019. So that, that gas main replacement will happen in that, in that same construction window, but we haven't laid out exactly you know, what month we're going to be in what area. Um, between the time you lay the cable and the time you lay the, 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 uh, the plastic gas pipe, how long will it be between the two months? And I'm going to give you, say, 100 foot stretch. <coughs> I think, I think the way it's going to have to work is that this, you know, this progression, if it's laying gas main, has to has to get by an area, and then we would come through again and, and lay the electric line. So it's so the gas first. I think that's probably what's going to happen. We have we haven't fully laid out the schedule yet, but uh, the, the gas, you know, we obviously don't want to be involved in so creating we, gas leaks yeah. either. So. so we're going to have to coordinate that with them because. <laughs> You know, when they put the new gas main in and they plan to cut over the services, you know, we'll want the new gas main installed and then we'll have to cut the services over. So we'll have to coordinate that and sequence that into the work they're doing. Um, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's 4,200 feet of gas main that we're replacing along with all the services associated with it. So the first thing they'll do is put the 4,200 feet of main in and then they'll liven the main up and then they'll come back and cut the services over from the existing main. You know, they'll pull the new services in and cut it over to the new main that they've lined up. So, you know, it'll be a little bit of a process and we'll just have to coordinate that with them. So, probably a little bit early right now to, you know, to uh, to coordinate it right now, but you know, we'll have to figure out as close we get to the project how that's going to work out. Yes. Yeah, I've worked sort of on the street. So, if I understand this correctly, both sides of the street are going to be required to be dug up, one for the gas portion and then one for the logical portion? Yeah, that's, that, that, may not, that may not be true everywhere. What, what we have to do is we have to, you know, we know where the gas is and we have an idea where the, where the town wants the gas to, to go. And that's probably going to be in close proximity to where it is now. We, we have to kind of site our new facility where there's room between the existing utilities. So in some areas we're probably going to be on the same side of the street as the gas and in other areas depending on what other utilities are there, and maybe on, on the other side of the street. So what will be the duration of construction for both these projects on Sand Street? We're talking a couple of months? It's, yeah, it's, it's going to be measured in months, sure. Will it require the closure of any portions of Sand Street to do this? What we're, what we're doing is we're, we're developing a traffic maintenance plan for the whole project. Um, the, as, as we're going down the street, there's just, just by the nature of the construction, there's going to be some restriction on traffic flow. There, there, may be, there may be some localized detours to get around the area. We may, we may have areas where we're um, dealing with alternating one-way traffic, that sort of thing. Um, and that, that's one of the reasons why we may have to do this in two separate spreads, is to keep enough of the road available for traffic maintenance. And, and we will be we will be coordinating the whole traffic maintenance plan through the uh, Department of Public Works and through the police uh, department and all that. But it's still going to be a total duration time for the construction, whether it's for the rain of the cables or for the gas line on Salem Street to take up other portions of the project. Yeah, uh, installing two utilities is going to take more than installing one gas. So do you intend to wait until after the EFSB decision to start this plan? Yes, we, we can't install any of this without. But oh, you had to start the planning after the decision. Oh no, no, we're we're developing. We're develop our construction plans are almost almost complete at this point. We've, we've met with the town and, and gone through where we're proposing the line and where where the utilities are. We're we're actually developing our traffic maintenance plan. So that's that that's all happening in parallel with the current effort. It sounds like there's a lot more details to the. Developed, right? We're not sure whether you have one pass or two, some good things, or two passes. Uh, whether you're going to lay, you're going to lay the gas pipe first, and then the electric. And then the electric. That, that's probably what will happen. Yeah. The, the other thing is that when we hire a contractor and we're putting our specs together to hire a contractor, 
he, he may have ideas of how to do this more efficiently and, and that sort of thing. So that it's, it's not unusual to be developing this level of detail at this stage in the process and planning, you know, planning out how we're going to do the 2018 construction. So it's unusual for, for us. Okay. Yeah. It sounds like there's no, the 50 to 100 feet a day is no good. But we have, here we're saying we don't know. So there's two trenches, one trench. What order the trenches are going to be, the works are be done. So to me, that's kind of important. Well, the, the, the gas relocation is probably going to happen first. In some areas, it may make sense to put them in a common trench if there's room to do that. In other areas, just because of I can't give you a definite answer for the whole group because it's probably going to vary. Um, and then with respect to the service outages for the gas, uh, will there be service outages for the, while you're cutting over the service to the new line, or, or will that be kind of transparent? That will be coordinated with the home owner. <coughs> so typically a day, an hour? Um, it would be, you know, we'd notify you. Put a flyer on and then let you know that uh, the guests are going to be cut off. It'll be a, a few hours, so we'll let you know. <coughs> so. And then the electric service should, should be just no, nothing on the electric service. Really nothing on the electric. Is there a minimum distance that gas line has to be from the conduit for the mm -hmm. electrical power lines? Yeah, the, 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 the National Electric Safety Code calls for, uh, I believe it's a 12 inch minimum separation between gas oh, and electric. That's really important. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Uh, Paul Vaughn, 168 So it sounds like it would be fair to say that the replacement of this gas line. Um, the other thing, too, is that um, as part of that traffic management plan, they will meet with uh, public works, police department, fire department, school department. We'll be, put, we'll be meeting as a group to kind of work out that schedule exactly how it's going to go, okay? But we've already talked about that preliminarily regarding going by the Doyle School when you go by the Galvin time frames and stuff like that. Yes, sir. Okay, so uh, um, I got a couple of questions, uh, a little different than what everybody else has brought up here. So um, I'm sort of representing uh, Stony Hill Lane, which is inviting the power station directly right behind them. So um, for the noise, I, I guess I'm going to bring that up. I brought up the last meeting, and I really didn't get an answer. So was there a noise analysis done? And I see on one of those charts it says 1 dB. I can't say I actually have an acceptable answer. So it's a 1 dB, I guess, degradation of noise with this new wall based on what data? As, as part of this project, we did a, uh, a noise modeling study of the area where we put in uh, monitoring equipment and study the, study the air over a 24-hour period so we can find out what's happening during the day, what's happening at night. And we use that data to model the new equipment going into the substation to see what impacts that might have. And we use that, the results of that study uh, to design a new sound wall to mitigate the impacts of that noise. So under, under the proposed conditions, what we're proposing is that there'll be no increase in the noise that you hear now. So the noise varies. And I know there was, you had described that there might be other power lines, which at least from my experience, is usually more of like a static noise. The noise that at least we're hearing is more of a low level humming noise which is more of a transformer. So that, that varies depending on the time of day, the way the wind blows, the humidity, the rain, the snow, et cetera. And I'm not sure if you've actually taken all that into consideration. That, in conjunction with your analogy of like 93 and expanding from two to three lanes, I guess the question is, is the capacity going to be increasing? And what has the capacity been over the last five years? That's probably a better question for Perhaps Jack. A backup plan, but the backup plan really isn't adding a lane to a highway. When you're adding a lane to a highway, that means 
that there is more volume going through that highway, which means there's going to be more current and means more power, meaning more noise. So yeah, what, what this project is doing is not adding capacity from the through the transformers at the station. This is on the 345 kV lines, so it's on the, the higher voltage. It's not doing anything to the load being served at that Wakefield Junction substation. Well, I guess the question is why are we adding anything? We're not adding a load. What, what? We're adding a cable between two high voltage substations, Wakefield Junction and Woburn. At, at 345 kV, to increase the reliability of the loop that serves the greater Boston area. We're not adding to the capacity of the Wakefield Junction substation. Okay. So then, so then my, I guess the question I asked last time was, so in the last five years, I guess, has the capacity either grown, or what is, what is the capacity in the last five years? So you mean the, the, load, the load served at that substation? Is that? Yes, yes. I, I don't have those numbers right with me. Do we have those numbers in January? Is that possible? Can somebody yeah. provide those numbers? Because I know I asked the last you know, time so, yeah. meeting, and um, I guess if I was a project manager, I would know the highs and lows and understand where, what capacity was, because it's generating revenue, I guess, too, right? So if, no, you know, the, this cable has got nothing to do with the load at that substation. I'm just talking about the substation right now. Just the existing substation. Yeah. And I guess my question is directly associated to the noise that we're experiencing. We'll, some we'll, days, we'll look at what the values are for the loads being served at that substation. Okay, so we'll, we'll get, get that information. We'll report analysis of some sort the next time on Monday. If we get an email or just somebody we can email to identify that. If you email the project, which is on all of the, any of the stuff that you grabbed in the, in the project, if you email the project web's uh, email address, we can, we can get an answer. We can email you back. Okay. But, but, but just to try and come back to your, your, your question, if the load is going through that substation is increased, that's because of what's drawing the load. It's the customer's demand is drawing that. It's not being forced through or something. That's a good point because then we know it's not, for example, a consistent load. It's, it's going up and down. This is what you're telling So depending on if somebody... If it's a super hot day, everybody turns on air conditioners, there's a likelihood that that buzzing is going to go up more than 1 dB. I'm not familiar with the, the sound study, so I don't know if the, the noise is being driven by the loading of the transformers or the energization of the transformers, just, just being on. I, I don't know. Maybe Dan can. Trying to address two of the points. One that you brought up earlier about when did you measure and what were the different conditions, as well as what you just asked. Um, so first, again, my name is Dave Clinton. I work for Epsilon. Obviously, I don't do all this work for myself. We have an acoustics group in my company. So we put out meters around, you know, including on Stony Hill Lane, at the, at the very edge of the road, around the perimeter of the substation. They run 24 hours a day for, depending on the weather, which goes to your question, anywhere between one and two weeks. We take that data, we look at the ambient noise level, and we take the quietest hour and quietest four hours from the quietest days. And that's what we use as background. So theoretically, right, that, that if there's some wind, if there's rain, we don't count the data. If there's wind above a certain degree, we don't count the data. So we're taking the quietest of the quiet times and using that as the baseline for our model. And to address your question on when the current or load increases, the noise increases, when we take the equipment that's going to be put into the substation and model it, the manufacturer gives us data on the average and loudest noises. So that would be the loudest noise under the maximum current draw that that piece of equipment, excuse me if I'm using the electrical terminology wrong, but at its greatest noise. So we're using the quietest background for the model base and the loudest noise the equipment makes to make that evaluation. And then saying, at the property boundary, does it go up, does it go down in relation to ambient or existing conditions? And then we modeled the wall to make sure it doesn't get any louder. Yeah. 
the testing was done at the fence line of the substation, and there's a reason for that. It's the Massachusetts law from the Mass DEP requires that the noise measurements for ambient be taken right at the substation, but one was taken to the southeast at the end of your road, the northwest, um, near the other cul-de-sac end, to the eastern side, which is, you know, empty all the way out to, to Water Street. So it, it at the corners of the substation property. Because you could have taken data during a week where it was nobody had any heat, air conditioning on. So your, your worst case scenario could have been the best case scenario for not having a, uh, anybody really create a, a better sound delivery. So it, could, it would have been 50 dB instead of 90 dB, where like on a hot, muggy day, it's really like 75 dB. So if your data says we got 2 to 50, you're building a wall for 2 to 50, you average that, so that's what, 25? Versus we're experiencing potentially 75 dB. There are days that it's very loud, and I don't think you guys actually have that experience that. Uh, so it'd be interesting to understand what days of the week, what week out of the year that this testing was actually done, because we hear it, and you obviously aren't. It, and just like, you know, the aesthetics part is the next question I'll have, which some people say they don't see the station, but everybody else does. <coughs> so I guess my next point is from an aesthetics perspective, I saw what's up there, and technically you guys are a neighbor, right? Because you're, you're up there. So if I was a neighbor to Key, for example, I'd probably say, hey, listen, I'm going to put up a fence, but I'm going to put up a nice fence, or maybe we can discuss what kind of fence that we can both agree on, so aesthetically it looks nice. So I'm not sure that aesthetically is suitable for any of the neighbors based on what that looks like. So I think the proposal was maybe throw up some trees up there or something that aesthetically allows it to be a little more pleasing for the neighbors, even the people driving by. So there's a couple of things with, with doing a lot of plantings by substations. One of them is uh, we have to look at uh, the security standards for the substation and what I would propose instead of throwing some trees up that could possibly go against what security would want us to do is I am more than happy to come in and talk to you guys and take a look at your view from your homes and just talk about doing some visual mitigation at your home where we could plant some stuff so that when you're out in your backyard you don't see it. Well, at least, at least give us the opportunity to come meet you so you can see from your perspective. I, I, I think that's a great idea. I mean, I, I work from home, and I my office is facing the substation. And I, I mean, I actually wear a Bluetooth earpiece on this side of my head because I hear the buzzing. And if I'm sitting in the perfect uh, angle, it actually hurts. So I just don't think you're, you're hearing it, but it, we can set up a day in the next week or so. Sure. Well, okay, maybe not in the next week. I'm on vacation. <laughs> but I'm on vacation. Um, <laughs> I'm on vacation until January 2nd. Um, as of whenever I get home tonight. <laughs> um, however, I'm more than happy to, to work and set something up when, I, when I'm back in January, if that's all right. Give you guys time to talk and decide and think and I, I do the holidays. I've got your email address so I can send you that as long as you respond. I think I'd, I'd be happy with that. I, I think it'd be good for us to talk about the noise and if you're willing to do something aesthetically, that would be sure, absolutely. Acceptable. Uh, I guess the only, the only other question I have is from a traffic manager perspective because we're that first street right before you know, get up in Montrose to get out to 95. So I know, what, what time are they going to start construction in the morning and the afternoon? Again, I think it's 7 a.m. We, we have to follow all of the rules set forth. Okay. Um, town bylaw uh, provides that they can work Monday through Saturday, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. The work will probably be 7 a.m. to uh, 4 p.m., 5 p.m. Um, they obviously don't want to spend overtime um, on if they can help it. Um, but And if they do want to need to work overtime, they have to get a permit from us to do that after 7 p.m. Um, 
the uh, um, and streets won't be, you know, that it will be temporarily blocked when they go by, but that'll be at nighttime. It'll be open back up again. It's just no different than any other construction project. If we came by and we're doing a water main, we'd have to block going across that street. But they'll put road plates down or and pave right after they get backfilled. Okay, so you'll always be able to get into your property um, when needed, get in and out and stuff. Okay. No, I didn't say that. They're not. They don't plan on doing construction on Saturday unless they absolutely have to. Okay. I said they can do construction on Saturday. Okay. And that's that would be uh, something that tipped the Salem Street groups in favor of, say, the new Salem Streets. Mm -hmm. Along with the paving of the rail bed, these are things that really tip to this group. It's in this group's favor. No, for the not, not actually the the New Salem versus Salem Street. So the New Salem Street was looked at as one of the alternative routes instead of going up Salem Street, and it was scored in a way that didn't make it favorable. As well as, I do believe that. Dave, do you want to answer this? I'm sorry. Yeah, sure. uh, the, the New Salem Street variation, which is still a, a variation on the books, it's in front of the EFSB. It's not the preferred route, but it is a variation. Uh, the, the overall scoring, so, so Danielle showed the slide that had the 16 criteria. So we collected a ton of data on all of those criteria and scored both variations. The scoring, which is publicly available, is pretty similar. The cost is pretty similar. I think when you say what tipped it, um, there's increased thought that the constructability on the railroad, which is Phil, you know what's there, uh, would be easier to build on than New Salem Street, which crosses the Mill River floodplain, which does have mapped deep peat deposits, which can, which can be, and I'll let the engineer speak to it, but obviously deep peat deposits can be problematic for a big project. And it does provide the potential value to the town in the future if they want, the, the, I should say, the, the railroad right away, the preferred route, provides the potential for the future use of a recreational facility. So those things combined is what tipped it. Uh, the gas line relocation really was not something that had anything to do with that. It actually came, came around later. Yes, sir. Richard Shea, 158 Broadway. I just had a question. I was discussing uh, a little bit earlier on the construction part of it. Um, I believe that there's approximately every 1,700 feet there will be a manhole structure installed. Is that a maintenance structure, first of all, or take me for a trip down that end? So what's down there? So we're, just so everybody can hear, because that was your voice is is a little bit low. But he asked basically every 1,700 feet there's a manhole. And is that a maintenance structure? So we're going to take a walk down a manhole. Okay. Uh, the way this system is built, we, we, we put in underground conduits in the ground, and that's, that's kind of what that um, construction spread is going. <laughs> we, we can only pull the cable so far before the cable either can't withstand the, the forces on it during the pulling, or, or sometimes there's electrical reasons, and, and sometimes it's just the size of the reel we can get across the road. So the manholes are, are put in place for the initial installation to allow us to pull a cable. And, and they're set as pretty much as far apart as we can put them so that we, we you know, limit the number of splices that we have to make. But what happens in those manholes, and those, if you get a picture of those, is like a small basement. So we pull the cables into the manholes from both directions. And what we do in the manholes is we splice the cables together. Now that, that happens about every 1,700 feet. Um, once the line is in service, the, the manholes will be subject to periodic inspection so that we can make sure that our splices are OK and that you know, we're not experiencing corrosion or anything like that. But they're, they're part of the original installation, which so we can only pull the cables so far. So on my trip down the manhole, <coughs> if I can fit, uh, the, um, 
you go down there, there's going to be the pipe itself. Is the flow of the fill over that, the concrete? Is it covered over? And I guess added to that question might be, does that manhole actually act as a vent? So is there any additional EMF that comes up through that manhole structure? Is it a sealed structure? Is manhole cover gasketed and, and bolted down? I guess those are the kind of questions. And plus the size of the unit is approximately, I think you said, about 30 feet. Yeah, the, the, the manholes for this voltage are going to be about 30 feet long. <clears throat> the, the conduits themselves actually end at the end walls of the manhole, and the cable itself goes through the manhole, and the splices are basically done around the middle of the manhole. Um, <clears throat> the, we, we don't normally like seal the covers, and that, that really wouldn't do anything for magnetic fields, if you will. Um, you've got you're down whatever how many feet you're down in the trench and you're flow filling all of the uh, all of the conduit. That area there doesn't have flow fill on it. Does that create any addition an escape route whereas everything else is on the concrete pavement? Is there an escape route for it? I'm not understanding really uh, pretty much, but is that is there a higher concentration or a higher amount that's over that manhole section rather than um, the, the flowable fill or the concrete that we have in the main trench actually doesn't really do anything for the magnetic fields or electric fields. Um, in, in the manholes, the cables are probably going to be deeper. Um, so so I, I guess I'm not sure I, I'm fully answering your question, but it, it's, it, it's more of yeah. are there higher the way they measure the levels, so there are higher levels near these manhole structures, but I don't think you can run 17 <clears throat> Yeah, they, they, they may be a little bit higher, and that, that has to do with um, when, when we're in the trench, we, we can arrange the cables in sort of a triangular arrangement. In the manholes, they, they tend to, um, we have to kind of roll them into a more vertical configuration so we can splice them. Um, <clears throat> But, uh, and I, th I think the simulations we've done have shown they're, they're maybe a little bit higher, but in the same general range as what you'd have in the main trench. Excuse me. <clears throat> um, I think that you said that there were 16 proposed routes that, that um, you had. And I was just kind of wondering um, what routes were presented to Wakefield as proposed routes? Was it just this one route that they came up with? Or? No. So there's 16 criteria that we used to score the routes. There were over 30 routes that were looked at and, and developed. And okay. My name is Dave Clinch. I, I helped drive the, the routing analysis and was at almost all the early meetings uh, with the town, quite a few of them. Uh, we had a figure up there, I call it the spaghetti figure. It's uh, because it looks like someone you know, threw a handful of spaghetti on it. it. We can only show the main routes because to be honest with you, uh, I have a crew of you know, half a dozen folks who are out in the field taking photos, evaluating individual streets. We drove up and down every street that you can get to to connect the Warburton substation to the Wakefield one. So what we came to the town with was a couple of maps. One, the spaghetti figure, hey, here's, the, here's all of the routes that we've looked at, and by the way, there's a lot of little connectors in there that you don't see. And then we said, hey, there, here's three or four that are shorter, that, you know, because obviously the, every one of those would come to a different length. So we said, hey, so, some of these are shorter. Some of these are over nine, ten miles. Some are as short as eight and a half miles. Um, so here are the shorter ones. Here are the more direct ones. Here are the ones that passed by the fewest individual residences the fewest businesses, the fewest parks, things like that. And so, for example, we had suggested um, using Water Street, going east on Water Street and north on Montrose. That was one of the earlier routes. It still came up Broadway, Albion to Broadway, but then, you know, took a farther east route, came over past Farm Street where we are now. Um, there were, th that was one of the ones I, I had initially mapped personally that I thought would be a good one. Well, we did some more research and talked to the town and found out that Water Street's got a whole bunch of real problematic subsurface issues, drainage issues, high groundwater. So I'm just giving you that as an example. I would say there were probably about a half a dozen 
routes that we thought were better than others based on predominantly on length and the, the smallest amount of things we pass, sensitive receptors like homes. And that's what we showed the town and reviewed with the town in those early meetings. And so the final, well, I know not final, but the, the proposed that we have now that we know of was something that was agreed upon by the town and, and that one group by the town and your, um, I guess, suggestions. I understand, I understand what you mean. Um, I wouldn't say that we took, met with the town and they said go to that route. That really wasn't the case. They did say, hey, you know, that street's better than this one. Hey, don't go by the parking garage for the tea. You know, that's a bad idea. Don't. There were certain locations they said to try and avoid. But they did not dictate routes. That really was me. I'm responsible for that. And so the, the preferred route, the preferred route with the new Salem Street variation, which is still on the table with the two variations in Wakefield, they came out as the best. When I scored them based on those 16 criteria, plus measuring the length, and obviously the length is directly relative to cost, so then we came back to the town and we said, we heard your inputs. We, we incorporated those into that set of data we had we used for scoring and came up with these as the better of the routes. And those two routes were the, the two that ultimately were the, what, what National Grid determined were the most appropriate and were presented to the town. Yes. So that is, that is publicly available information for what it's worth. There, um, when you file a petition with the Energy Facility Siting Board, the first phase you may be aware of is the discovery phase. Once your application is complete, you go into discovery. It's sort of similar as, as, as you know, going to court. Right? So anybody can ask questions. Interveners can ask questions. You could ask a question. The town could ask a question. And of course, the EFSB asks hundreds of questions. Um, It, I, the 12893 alternative was initially requested when we had a meeting with the town of Stoneham. It was actually, uh, I believe it was uh, the, the state senator, Lewis, who, who said, hey, you need to look at 93 and 128. That's very direct. We went and then met with the Mass DOT to talk about that. They have something called the utility accommodation policy. It talks about putting utilities in roads. So we went back, we counted all of the, the length. We looked at locations where there was shallow bedrock to the extent it could be known. We looked at the space within the roadway. We looked at the pinch points, like the overpass over Route 28, where the granite outcrops come close to the road. And we came up with a draft design. We also came up with a separate draft design that was within the highway layout, but off of the traveled way. The bottom line on this 128 approach was that um, the Mass DOT would not allow the installation of a utility underneath an active lane, and you could not acquire easily or, or route it along the side of the road because you're aware that much of 128 is countersunk into granite. So there are a number of reasons, and these are documented publicly, why it wasn't why it wasn't chosen. And I'll say just anecdotally, as part of the hearing process we had, 13 days of hearings, and we talked about this at the last Board of Selectmen meeting, some of the other towns, they hired experts to, to look at the different routes and to look at the whole project. Stoneham hired an expert who, who looked at the 128-93 route uh, and thinking that it had been self-promoted, meaning that National Grid and Eversource had promoted it. So that's the most ridiculous thing ever. Anybody that does this work knows that you can't route within a highway layout, that the DOT won't allow it, that it's impossible to build and maintain. I only raise that not to be devil's advocate. But a third party evaluator looked at it and said, it's not practical, it's not cost efficient, it can't be built, there's a lot of problems with that. And that is really what we found as well in our evaluation. Yes, sir. Uh, Richard mentioned the manhole covers, the 35 feet long and a metal. Is a 35 foot section of metal? No, the, the, the manhole itself. Uh, the, the question was whether the manhole covers themselves are 35 feet long. Uh, they're not. The, the manhole itself, is, you could picture that as an underground room. That, that's made out of concrete, precast concrete. The, the covers are normal size. They're about three feet in diameter. You brought up the, the difference between the cabling in the underground 
and the cabling in the manhole. The cabling underground is a diamond shape. <coughs> a triangular, I think. Triangular shape, and the, ground, and the wire in the manhole is level. <coughs> uh, it's vertical. Vertical. Yep. Which gives off more air. Uh, it might be slightly higher. Because a, 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 a triangle is almost a zero value. Uh, I think if you look at our charts in the back, it's, it's not quite zero, but we're we're, we're showing a low, relatively low magnetic field. The cover is substantial, is more EMF than the other. But why couldn't they all be, even in that section? Is it just because of the connection, the terminal strips? Um, you, you actually you actually need to to be able to work on all three cables within the manhole. Uh, triangular arrangement just, I think, becomes really difficult to splice in the manhole. In the pipe in the street, are they, are they formed in individual tubes in a, in a diamond shape or, or in a triangle shape, or <clears throat> do they just pull tight in a triangle shape? Uh, it, it's individual conduits. And, and what we do is we get we get factory made spacers, and those spacers actually maintain the. We see up in the, in the wires up on the uh, above the street the spacers. No, no, these 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 are just plastic frames that hold the conduits in place. Right. I've seen them. On, I thought I'd seen them on the uh, high tension wires now. Uh, there, there are some overhead lines that do have, I, I guess, spacers. Uh, okay, so that's. I didn't know about the difference in wiring depending on whether you're in the manhole or not, or the trench. I have another question on the curve to curve. Mm -hmm. I'm on Broadway, and our curve is about an inch and a half high. So when you add a new street, we no longer have a curve. But you want to address that. <coughs> Uh, Rick Stinson, Public Works Director, uh, and we've met with them on all the roadway work, and that they'll meet our requirements when we do that. So we'll be adjusting curbing where we need to and stuff like that. Uh, they'll do a cold plane and overlay when it's all done, um, and it'll be a two-inch overlay over the whole roadway. Um, but we'll be looking at all the curbing and everything, and there'll be some other stuff that we'll do ourselves. Right. Okay. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. This is a general question, um, maybe not relevant to the construction, but National Grid, is that a private company? Uh, no. no. Uh, I mean, how is it regulated? Is it it's a privately held public utility. Okay, so public utilities can be privately held. So who determines how much electricity? Is this like a national plan that everybody so doing this all over the country? I'm just thinking, like, who decides that we need this electricity? So Does that the federal government? government? Does the state government? Does do towns? Or does the company itself? So Nas the National Grid doesn't determine this. The, the, uh, the entity that determines this is the independent system operator, which is a nonprofit entity that manages and uh, studies the transmission system which provides the electricity to areas and to the different states and regions. Stuff is, uh, who are, who's paid to do that? Is it a state job, a federal job? Uh, what I'm trying to think is where's this money coming from to build this stuff? Is it federal funds? Is it, is it for profit? What is it? You know, back in the, I forget when, but remember when California lost all its power because one company was draining it and simply regulating it? I forget the name of that. It was a big yeah, scandal. Well. Uh, yeah, uh, so, so, Jack Martin, so who, yeah, so who regulate? This is just a mystery. <laughs> is this happening I'll, I'll, in California? I'll all these cables being put down? Is it happening all over the country? And how are they connecting? No, the, the need for this scale is determined by, as Danielle said, the Independent System Operator of New England, which is a nonprofit company 
which is uh, basically hired by the Electric Reliability Corporation, which is a countrywide thing that responds to the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Their charge is to make sure that the regional electricity supply here in New England is reliable and, and adequate and secure. And they do that by studying the system. Companies like National Grid that own transmission uh, were part of the team doing that study with ISO New England. Eversource was also on that team. But the ISO runs the study. They have criteria that we have to meet to ensure that we have a reliable system and supply of electricity to municipals like Wakefield, to individuals, homeowners, and such. But our focus is on the transmission system, not on your distribution wires. Who pays for all this? It's, it's the ratepayers who pay for this. You're, 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 I think we did a calculation. The, the rates are going to go up on the, I, I forget the exact number, but as a regional improvement, this project is being supported by ratepayers throughout New England. It's not just Wakefield, it's not just Massachusetts, it's all six states. Yes. Yes, yes, you can. Yes, yes, it is. Okay, so you're actually... It, it's a publicly traded company. company. It's a, a public good, so you say, although I've never really experienced bad electrical trends. You know, we've had, what, several, three blackouts probably since. It's pretty reliable as it is. Mm -hmm. So these improvements, I mean, I've seen all of these wonderful electronic improvements over the years, but they cost a hell of a lot of money to the consumer. Mm -hmm. Some of it seems excessive. I'm just looking at it from that point of view. And by the way, what would happen during an earthquake? <laughs> We're 200 years overdue for a major earthquake. I know this is a silly question for some people, but does, did that ever happen in California with these grid problems, if they have them? <laughs> well, I mean, sorry, I can't help you. Sorry, I, I, these are maybe philosophical questions, but truly, I look at this, do we really need this? Except for people to make money. Do we really need this? This project is needed to think of it as um, when you're looking at, at a road like 93 or 95. And 25 years ago, it was fine for it to be a three-lane highway. But now you've got more people moving in, more businesses opening. That three-lane highway is, is congested 24-7. You have to add a lane. And that lane is going to allow for that traffic to move and not be as congested. 20 years ago, I was in, I was in college, well, I was in high school. I had one computer in my house. We had one TV in my house. We didn't have cell phones. Now everybody has multiple units that they're plugging in. There's TVs everywhere. You've got Wi-Fi. You've got, you know, your wireless speakers. All of this pulls on a system. Everybody wants to bring in more business. This pulls on a system that was built to support the electric need many years ago. So you, you do need this to kind of help feed and support a growing economy. Unfortunately, that's a question that consumerism, it's capitalism, and everybody feels this need for an enormous amount of electricity. I guess I'm an old, you know, hag. Well, cell phones, you know, I mean, I mean, just, it's crazy. <laughs> Starting with the cell phones yes, sir. and computers. Uh, one of my, uh, well, first of all, uh, any money that goes into this project that required uh, by the town of Wakefield, either their gas and light department, uh, the sewer or water department, anything that has to be done by the town as this project goes forward, is that all reimbursed back to, uh, in other words, we're not going to get, as a rate payer uh, for the you know, electric bill and gas bill and water and sewer bills, nothing's going to get back to us. It's all going to go on to this project. Is that correct? 
I, I don't, I don't well, understand what I'm getting at is, we, we don't want to, as, as a citizen in Wakefield, you know, we don't want to spend any money for construction as this thing's going forward. <coughs> I'll speak to the water drainage and suicide. Um, unless we want to upgrade something, which would be separate from this, and we don't have, we've looked at everything, we don't have any plans to upgrade anything, um, we, um, there would be no cost. It would all be what's going to take place, the roadway work, uh, trees that need to be replaced as we go along, it would be National Grid. Okay. National Grid, that was my question. The other question. And, and then on the gas side, it's the same thing. Yes, they, you know, the example is Salem Street. Mm -hmm. They've uh, they've agreed to do some work on Salem Street at, at their cost as part of the project, not at the uh, gas and light department's cost. And yeah, how about the police details? Does that all We pay for that. Yeah, yeah that, the project pays for the police details. Okay. Uh, yes. Other question. Yep. Um, currently, uh, there's an overhead, I'm assuming there's an overhead transmission line that connects these two substations right now. Is that, is that how we're? No, yeah. sir. There isn't. Nope, that's why we're building it. I see. So this is, but is this like a, this is like a separate circuit, a sep uh, like an extra circuit in case what, whatever connects this stuff, uh, whether, it, whether it goes around in circles, this is a separate circuit. So um, if, you, if that had to be shut down for some reason or other, mm -hmm. right, everything goes back to normal, you just you, you shut the circuit off, do whatever you've got to do on the street, put it back on again. But that their statement? Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. So the... The issue that I really have is how this interfaces with the infrastructure that we have in the ground right now, which is some of it's probably over 100 years old. And going forward, what's it going to cost us uh, to open the street back up and have to work around this new conduit that's in here? In other words, every time the street opens up and you got to put a service in for a, for a sewer or gas or something like that, you know, uh, is this is this whole system below our infrastructure, or is it <coughs> parallel uh, on the same level? Just the implementation of the street. Cool. Um, it will run below, beside, over. Um, at the end of the day, um, we would be doing the same thing whether this was there or not. Okay, if we got to replace a water main. We're going to dig that up and replace that. We would have to go under gas mains. We would have to go under, um, uh, could be sewer, could be drainage. Uh, it's no different than that. Um, to, you can't, would there be an added cost to that? Um, there might be a little, but probably very little, okay? And, and in many cases, there'll be no cost at all additional related to it. Uh, the other question that I had was, uh, and I brought it up at the uh, selectmen's meeting was the depth, the average depth of this from the, from street grade down to down to the I guess would be the top of the ball uh, uh, or the, uh, the ductwork that's going in. Uh, is that 12 feet? Is that what I understood? About 12 feet in the ground? We 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 design it based on minimum depth. And, and then we, we have to, uh, as we're avoiding existing utilities, we, we generally have to go deeper to get, get past things. Um, I don't know if we've actually calculated the average depth, but uh, in, in a lot of cases we are going to be deeper than the, than the minimum depth that, we've, that was designed. Well, I think ideally, uh, you know, going forward, you know, the deeper would be the best you know, for a lot of reasons, but the deeper would be the best way, the best way to go. And of course, until you hit some ledge. And, uh, and Montrose <coughs> Avenue is guaranteed to be legend. Mm -hmm. that's, that's guaranteed. I don't know how you're going to get around that. But yeah, what, what, you know, what we have to look at is the deeper you go, the more it costs to construct. The deeper you go, the the slower it takes to actually do the construction. If, if if we were to put this whole thing 12 feet deep, the shoring requirements become much more extensive. We probably wouldn't be doing the 50 to 100 feet a day. It would be much slower than that. So, so we're balancing, you know, reasonably quick constructability versus what we have to do to avoid the obstructions that are in the way. I'm looking at the attrition in me, but I'm looking in the long view, 
You know, so if that stuff is out of our way every single time we got to deal with infrastructure for the next hundred years, you know, the farther down the better. You know, if it costs a few more bucks to do it, do it. <clears throat> now, having said that, are you guys familiar with Deer Island out in Boston Harbor? Yes. All right. When that facility went in, there was an underground power line that went from, from South Boston out to that island to feed that facility. And Eversource, um, I don't know, because these companies changed, it was NSTAR, I don't know what company it was when it originally went in, but anyway, Eversource owns that, that line that goes from point A to point B. So, in the contract, they were supposed to put that 25 feet below the seafloor, point A to point B. So when the contractor went out there to do it, they hit a lot of ledge. And some of that ledge, they rolled that, they rolled that underground cable up over the ledge to the point where it was about 12 feet below the seafloor, which probably wouldn't have been a problem until uh, a few years ago when the Army Corps of Engineers decided they wanted to dredge a good, a good chunk of that harbor. Now the cable is in the way. So that turned into a big lawsuit. So finally, Eversource got stuck with it. And uh, so now they have to rip that cable out. They have to put a whole new cable in, and they have to and they have to rip the other one out because they weren't watching your contract. So this is this is very important. You know, so going forward, you have to make sure you watch your contractors, right? Because they really screwed that one up. And uh, and of course, it all comes back to us because we're the rate payers, right? We have to pay for all this. So so you, know, you really got to do it right. So I, the, the the best you can do is keep your pipe away from our infrastructure. You know, because we're going to get stuck with this thing for the next hundred years. Thank you. Sure. So just a clarification on the rate payer piece. Yes. You know, you have your rates that you pay that are, that, you know, are your rates, the transmission costs. So th this this would be captured under the transmission costs. So you have your distribution costs, your service sure. costs. Those are set, those are part of your, your rates. Sure. The, the transmission cost is that they, they, there's some flexibility that they pass through some of the cost on, on the transmission. So it's... It's slightly different on the, on the on the rate. So there's a difference between the, the rates that we have set for the town and the transmission cost. The transmission cost is some you know flexibility the way that's structured versus the rates that that uh, maybe have that are fixed. So the rates your your rate doesn't change, but the transmission cost might change based on on this. So that as a as the cost gets passed through a little bit. So there is a little difference difference on the rate. So the, the rates. Your electric rates won't change, but there may be some, you know, there, there may be some impact based on a, uh, a slight change in the transmission costs. Okay, yeah. Just, so I understand. I have some of the window that says we need it for regional reliability. <coughs> so I assume that since it's transmission, this is getting rate based across the region. It's not right. just Wakefield residents. Can be paid. It could be New Hampshire residents paying for part of this too. So we're not likely to see very large. How about the gas line? Is that rate based or is that what you feel? No, so the gas line, we, we, wouldn't, we, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't be paying for that. That goes in under this rate base? Yes. Or is this a national grid saying? Yes, uh, so you, you, the yeah. gas cost, uh, or any other associated cost, including the or any other associate cost with this project is captured as a project cost and goes under the uh, rate based impact. So, so in essence, Greenfield is getting a gas line bundled in, a rate base paid for by all you know, power customers. I will put it that way. So, uh, yeah. That was an uh, ancillary work that we would have to do to do this project. So if, if it wasn't, so, so if it wasn't done by them, and we did it, you would be paying 100% of the rate. Yeah. So, so the way we've structured this with them, because they're impacting the gas line, and they'd be causing more leaks by working next to it, they're going to replace it, and it's beneficial for us. And they're spreading it, part of the project cost is being spread out. If they didn't do this, and we had to do this, we would be paying 100%, and that cost would be passed off to only the people that live in the town. So this is beneficial for the people living in the town. Does that make sense? Was there another question? Um, you mentioned minimum depth. What is minimum depth? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, the, the minimum depth is 
is, is the depth from the pavement down to the top of our concrete encasement. And uh, <clears throat> that, that was originally designed as uh, 30 inches, I believe, and uh, we've, we've actually increased that minimum depth to uh, three and a half feet. more questions I'm just I just want to hit a couple of the questions that were asked via Facebook because um, we are broadcasting live so people have entered some questions uh, the first one is um, what were the scores for each line or route and that's actually all available publicly on the um, EFSB filing and if you go to the project web page and you go to Woburn and Wakefield projects page, we actually have a link that you can click and just go right there. There were so many routes that were, you know, we presented. I, I can't go through and, and list the score for each one. But again, if you go to the website, we have a, an easy click that will just take you right there and you can read the entire um, report. Um, another one is how far out from each side of the underground cables will the, it, the question says electricity or radiation. There's no radiation. These are magnetic fields. Um, so how far out from each side of the underground cables will the magnetic field spread? 10 feet, 20 feet, 100 feet. So I think that's Peter. Uh, yeah, yes, good evening. Uh, I'm Peter Valberg. I did the uh, EMF analysis. And in terms of the answer to that question, we have uh, you know poster boards here at the back of the room that indicate what the uh, drop-off of magnetic fields with distance is. For these lines, it's relatively rapid. And uh, as you can see from the charts in the back, you know, the, directly over the line, the, the, the field is the, at its peak and then probably drops off within half of that, probably within 10 feet, and then continues to drop off uh, beyond that. So that uh, once you're, let's say, about 30 feet out, it's uh, probably going to be pretty close to undetectable. Have we done this type of construction right next to people's backyards where children play? Um, yes, we have done this type of construction. Uh, as I mentioned earlier during the presentation, we did this construction in Salem where we were running right down uh, historical streets in front of people's homes, businesses. Um, also, as well as when we did the, uh, the one in Providence, the underground line in Providence, again, that was through areas where uh, people live and work. We do this construction with overhead lines running through right-of-ways that, again, are on people's properties. We take a lot of pride in our outreach and also in our, in our restoration. So I'm with the project from beginning to end. Darren is with me from beginning to end. We have restoration programs so that when we are done and we're, we're talking to you throughout the construction process, we track all of that. And then what we will do is, you know, if, if we have to come back after the construction is complete and we have to repair anything, a, a driveway, a curbside, you know, grass, whatever it is, we repair that. We come back and, and we make sure that that is to the level that it was prior to us coming into and doing construction. Also, safety is a huge... Uh, Concern, not a concern, but it's it's a lifestyle for us at National Grid. So everything is safety first, safety first. So when we're out there and we're we've got you know a trench or something, our safety guys are out there. We're making sure that it's safe for the public. So um, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. And the last question we have from Facebook is, what specifically will improve reliability for Wakefield? Additional throw over capability, automatic transfer. This, this, I don't think this will, this will improve regional reliability. This, yeah, yeah, this improves the regional reliability. Regional meaning New England, greater Boston. Um, what it does allow us to also have, though, is have that extra, that other transmission line that can carry power for us should we need 
should there be any other problems with another transmission line, if we need to take one out to do maintenance or service, this is basically giving you that fourth lane on the highway so that the power can continue to flow instead of either getting backed up or not being able to pass or an outage, something like that. Uh, yes? So since, since we're on the highway, basically, um, my, my question is more of a comment. Um, I'm on Plymouth Road. Broadway is, is the street that abuts Plymouth Road. I'll be seeing construction if it goes down Broadway. Um, my guess is if this power line went by Charlie Baker's or the Secretary of the Department of Transportation's house or street, that they would seriously look at going straight up from Route 38, Woburn straight up to 128, and then down Salem Street and down Montrose to minimize the disruption of people's lives. I've talked to people in Winchester and Stoneham. Um, they are not wild about the, uh, the fact that it's going by schools and the way kids walk to schools. Um, I actually have in my backyard the Doyle uh, Kindergarten School, and, and there's a Congo line of traffic that goes by there twice a day. Um, you go by the Galvin, there's a Congo line of traffic going up North Ave. It's going to be very disruptive to have this big project going on for quite a while. Um, again, if I were Charlie Baker and it would go my, by my backyard, I'd call up the Secretary of Transportation and say, hey guys, I think we need to look at Route 128 and take the least disruptive route possible. So one of the things uh, that we were talking about was, was that traffic management plan. And we would be working with uh, the town as well as the schools to obviously we're not going to be doing construction and blocking the conga line of cars. We would make sure that we weren't, you know, that we would start work after, you know, everybody's dropped their kids off at school. That's, that's just common sense. Um, and the same thing. So we would be aware of, of working with the school so that we wouldn't cause more of a disruption there in the morning. Yes? I think the road there closed down four times a day because there's multiple drop-offs. It's a one-way street. Can you not do any construction on Broadway? Can you do the construction in July and August when school is closed? Because that's going to affect major... So we can work... I'm sorry. Part of the project schedule. Um, they, they have that opportunity by our bylaw, okay. But going by fields, um, they don't pass um, any ball fields when they go by. They, they well, they pass kind of the going in and out of um, uh, to the Doyle field, but that has two entrances in and out. But we can reloop that so they when they go. They're not going to be blocking both at once because you have Paul Ave and Doyle Ave. So you, you can reroute traffic with that so you can get into the field and out. But the same, yeah, exactly. for the guys on Montrose to try to get on Sony Hill to get out and just, is this going to, you know, Montrose backs up, but for us to get out onto Montrose to get the 95 is going to be. If, if we need to get a detail to help get people out of this street, if, if, there's, if, if there's a concern about that, we can easily do that. We, we would work that into the traffic management plan. We also, um, even though uh, you asked about the schools and, the, and, and things like that, one of the things that we are going to have on the website and also in the newsletter is we'll be giving you updates so that you know where we're going to be working and when. So it's not going to be like wake up and guess where National Grid is this week. You'll, if you get the newsletter and you opt into it and you look at the website, all of that will be there for you. It's, it's, we don't want open-ended questions. You know, we don't want you not to know what we're doing. Yes, sir. So just a quick question. So on my phone itself, is there, why can't you just go on these power lines and go straight to this? Before they answer that, I just wanted to go back to the school and the ball field thing. Our requirements from the town are pretty strict on getting by schools, time frames, and everything. Um, we do that um, all the time in a number of projects. 
So we're pretty strict on what we require for that. And now I'll let you. The, why can't we go up like where the gas station is? I, it's a wetland. It is deline it's a delineated wetland. So we can't, we cannot use it. Um, utilities are not uh, bypassed from that. We're in the road, so we're okay. Um, I do have some more Facebook questions. So those with questions, just hold on one second. Uh, has Wakefield Municipal Gas and Light asked for an underground duck bank for future distribution of electric cables? It's been evaluated and it's been decided no. Can you please make the scoring values for each route available on your website, not links, along with their scores on the 16 criteria? We, we can do that, and uh, we'll work on getting that on the website. Where can the public access the documentation showing the necessity for such a transmission line? That is in the EFSB filing, which we said on the website. You can click on the link, and it'll take you right to uh, the filing brief. More, oh, more questions. Yes, sir. Uh, no, sir. Construction hasn't started. We're still, construction can't start until we uh, receive the EFSB decision. It would be happening simultaneously. Yeah. You're welcome. Yes, sir. It is feasible to go down New Salem Street. It is feasible. It's not off the, off the table. As I, as I understand what you said. Okay. But the reason that you're not doing it is because of cost? No. Uh, no. Okay. Oh, okay, great, great. There, there is geological issues. Okay. But it is feasible to do it. It, it, it's a it's it's it's, an, it's a notice route within the EFSB petition. So while it's not the preferred route, it wouldn't be in the petition if it weren't technically feasible. Now, um, which I assume that there's a cost issue. Is probably would cost more. Is that there's a an uncertainty in constructability can increase cost. Okay. That's fine. Okay. In my original question, I asked how many times you have done this, and I got a very good response that you've been doing this quite a bit, that you have lots of experience in doing this underground work. Am I to believe that you've never tapped something similar to this industry? Mm -hmm. Have you ever done an underground cable in a situation, we're talking less than a half a mile, that has the same geological, whatever you want to call it, issues as New Salem Street? Have you ever encountered that before? I I can say, me personally, with all the projects that I've worked on, no. I can, I can, I'm more than happy to go back and look at, at, at previous projects that have been done, but, um, it might not be, it, well, if you had the choice, let's, just as an example, if you had the choice to build somewhere where you know the foundation may not be stable or somewhere where you know the foundation will be stable, you would choose where it's stable. That would make more logical sense. So that's kind of, if I'm understanding the routing process on why New Salem wasn't scored as highly as Salem Street, that's your, your base 
know if you have done this before in a in a situation that has similar characteristics as this instrument. I'll look it up. Sure. You got it. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. I have underground telephone and um, BIOS um, cables running underground. Is this uh, going to affect my landline phone, which is the only one I own? Yeah. And um, if so, uh, what, what can be done? This wouldn't affect your, your landline phone. Yeah, no. Mm -mm. Any other Yes, sir. If, um, I, I'm sorry, the, uh, the cable is routed down new sandwich. Um, when would the gas line be placed on the sandwich? That would be done if the line went down New Salem and it didn't go down Salem Street. It would have to be separate. It would, yeah, it would be done. Salem Street that, that they're going down that, that will be replaced with gas as well. So, so it's still happening. I will add one thing. Um, I think you all know if you live on that section of Salem Street that goes from the old where the railroad tracks went by up to New Salem, that needs to be paved. Okay? Um, and we would come cold plane and overlay that. Um, the as they as um, Dave mentioned, that's a steel gas line that currently has leaks. When we were going to repave um, uh, Lowell Street at Vernon, okay, when we went through and we coplaned, the vibration of that made the leaks bigger, and then all of a sudden it became an emergency to replace that line. Same situation. So the next uh, question I have from Facebook is, what improvements will you be making to the town? I've heard rail trail will be advanced, but to what extent? So again, we would what we would be doing is clearing out and cleaning up that whole uh, rail area that's been abandoned. Clean that up. We would be having to remove some of the trees. And then we would build the line, and we would pave over it so that you could then, the town, when they're ready for it, they could build up and actually make an entire rail trail from that. But we would leave it paved. Yes? I'm not so sure it's really a selling point because the highest field density of the 35 milligauss would be under, on the rail a maximum. If you were riding directly over the path of the field, it where the field starts to come back. There's a lot of people worried about the DNA. So, to give you some examples, there's rail trails uh, right along the transmission corridors in Saugus, Revere, Malden. Uh, where was F-158 North? 
Saugus Revere and Malden is, is the one that I know the best, that it's, a, it's an entire rail trail, very highly used, and it's under uh, transmission lines. Uh, well, those are, those are actually um, overhead transmission lines that are right there, and it's, it's highly used. Uh, there's actually Bike to the Sea and another biking group that actually put apps on and people put their rides in and everything like that. Um, we work very closely with them because they do um, utilize a lot of transmission corridors for, to build their bike trails. Yes. Okay. First one is, um, why is a Jackie more appropriate in a residential area, specifically in front of multi-family dwellings, compared to on New Salem Street, where the Jackie more would occur in the industrial area, there would be no residential units? Who wants this one? Construction? I think it's got across somewhere. The point is, why would it be better to do it? industrial area where there's no houses compared to right in a residential area and specifically in front of multi-family dwellings. <clears throat> Yeah, right. Right now we have two jack and bores that are that are in our design plans. One of them is is an active MBTA uh, train, you know, train track crossing, and we're actually not allowed to uh, to interrupt the tracks there, and that's why we're doing that jack and bore. <clears throat> there, there's another one r right on Salem Street as we as we come off the uh, MBTA right away, and. <clears throat> that that's to um, that that's because of the the proximity of some three uh, three large drainage culverts. Um, we're we're actually we're actually looking at that design now to see if we can potentially go above the culverts. We're uh, we're doing some test pitting just to get the exact depth of the culverts and see if we can eliminate the jack and bore. <clears throat> the 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 jack and bore is not. You know, it, it's a way to it's a way to cross utilities that we're not allowed to interrupt. No, I understand that, but would it be preferable to do it in an area where there's no residential housing as compared to a multifamily dwelling in a residential neighborhood? Yeah, it's not necessarily the same thing. It's not necessarily the same thing. It's not necessarily I'm not sure the Jack and Boar really. It's a very intrusive, long-term process. This isn't one or two days in front of somebody's house, correct? <clears throat> Again, it would be done. You know, it would be done during the construction hours that the town allows us to do the construction. A greater extension of time in front of those multi-family dwellings in a residential neighborhood, with Jack and Boys, compared to the straight cut place and move on with the standard rest of the case. Correct? <clears throat> uh, I, I don't think I agree with that. No. <clears throat> well, don't you have to control two pits? Place the equipment in there, and that equipment runs it over 90 decibels. There, there, will, be, there, will, be, there will be equipment to do a jack and bore, yes. I... Second question. Have you been down to Sound Street? Have you personally been down to Sound Street? Yes. <clears throat> yes. Okay, there's multi story buildings there. If the ground is strong enough to support three story buildings, how is it not strong enough to support a concrete encased? Three cable system for the distance that we're talking about here. I, we didn't say it's not strong enough. I'm just saying there seems to be this illusion that there's this issue with the peak that it's not the constructability is going to be not cost effective. I understand it's a preferred on alternate, but again, why is that why is that a, a minimizer as compared to going through a residential neighborhood when we can go down and do the construction in an industrial area? Far fewer houses, far less impacts. Jack and Moore's all the rest of that. You can see almost like that would be the preferred route unless there's a problem. And if there was a problem, then let's use what's conserved called out the preferred route instead. So in essence, they should be moving backwards. New Salem should be the preferred. Salem Street, the preferred route alternate. It seems we're going backwards and we're paying more to go the preferred route instead of less to begin with. You would think, let's try less expensive first if it doesn't work. Then we'll go Rick, I certainly understand your approach and why you believe going through Salem, which is an industrial area that's a couple hundred feet away from residential homes, is better than going 
20 or 50 feet away from residential homes. And I don't necessarily disagree that uh, you can see that one of the 16 criteria is residential density. So we counted every single house. Same thing for commercial. Uh, I wouldn't discount the impacts on commercial and industrial properties either. Uh, it's a matter of preference and you, how you weigh it. Uh, but do I believe that we should discount the potential for what could be significant construction difficulty and cost versus what is in, in, in some degree a known quantity in the railroad right away. Well, construction projects and infrastructure projects have uh, impacts on the public, it, it, every single one, every single time. And we have to weigh those. And we don't look at just New Salem or just that railroad right away in isolation. We look at it as part of an entire route. And based on the criteria that were set forth and you know presented in the petition, we're following those criteria um, in, in my opinion, exactly. Uh, so there are components of the New Salem variation that we could agree are better and components that are worse. But in the opinion of the company and in the opinion of, I believe, a lot of the folks that we've met with in the town, not just town representatives, there is a preference there. But clearly what we're talking about here is something that's very personal and discretionary. Um, so in this case, I would agree to disagree, but I understand your point. I, I think that the railroad right away provides a value, and I think the temporary impact is outweighed by the value of the project. Now, I, I, I believe that you're going to disagree with that, and that's, we, I respect that opinion, but that's, that's my, my judgment. Even though it's not the company's or fellow's fault, they could be agreeable to either one? Both are noticed because both are, are potentially viable. One right. is preferred. Right, and the, the companies were the ones that stated we have we can have a preference for either one regardless of what the EFSB says. This wasn't the EFSB said you're going to have this as another round. The companies, as part of their presentation, the EFSB said we have a preferred route and a preferred route alternate, and either one of those that you decide would be appropriate from the company's perspective if they decide on one or the other. Hi, I'm Beth Gorman, and um, I'm in house for National Grid and worked on the EFSB petition and proceeding. When we score and propose a route to the FSB, we have to choose what our preferred route is. New Salem was close enough to our preferred route based on the scoring that we decided to also provide that as an alternative. We don't always do that, but we decided to do that just in case during the proceeding there are any impediments to using the railroad right away, whether we weren't able to negotiate rights or whether we saw that maybe there were other impediments to going up the railroad right of way. And that's why we also noticed New Salem. Um, the issue, though, is that we have to choose one or the other. And that's what the FSB will approve based on what we've presented to them. Uh, so they're going to, they've been reviewing all the information that was presented. And at this point, they will either approve going up the railroad right of way all the way to, New, to Salem or if there's not information that shows that New Salem actually is clearly superior to going up the railroad right away, they would approve New Salem. But we don't have the option at this point. It's wh whichever the FSB looks at and approves next month when we, we're awaiting the decision. So we wouldn't be able to say, well, now we want to go down New Salem if the FSB approves going up the right of way all the way to, to, to Salem Street. Right. Be comfortable with either one as a decision. I think so one of the other questions that came up on Facebook is um, will maintenance of the line involve the use of herbicides and if so what herbicide would be used and where so for construction uh, projects when we have to do any kind of vegetation management we don't use herbicides we uh, go out there with crews and they have um, equipment whether it's hand tools uh, the industrial mowers things like that that will actually remove the vegetation uh, for maintenance i'm looking at my vegetation supervisor over there for maintenance um, the use of herbicides anything that would be used is anything that would be approved um, we don't go out and, and just use anything that you could buy at the store, but I can have him explain that a little bit more if uh, that's what is required. I'm the manager for transmission 
Forest Chief for National Grid. There won't be any bitch management on this project because it's all going to be paid. So that makes my job a lot easier. <laughs> so there won't be any herbicide work at all. I mean, there's not, we never, like Daniel said, we never do any for construction projects anyway. Um, um, vegetation management, and I assume it refers to um, the rail trail portion of it because otherwise there is no vegetation management basically, um, will probably happen from the town and that's related to maintaining the real trail to keep it uh, um, looking good. Um, you know, um, part of the real trail project will have signs that it's a real trail, will have uh, um, potentially benches or barrels or whatever, all of that stuff needs to be worked out and that stuff would be maintained by the town. Um, that would all be, that's all part of the state grant when they fund the rail trail to be built. But any vegetation management within that rail trail area to keep it uh, good looking and active would be the town. Another question from Facebook is how much more power are we really using given the increased availability of high efficiency appliances? Again, this project is not a customer uh, demands project. This is a reliability project. So there's a little bit of a difference. Yes, the energy efficiency and um, things like your LED light bulbs and all of that help you use less electricity. That's true. This is a reliability project, which means we're, we're making sure that the transmission system is bringing enough energy to the municipalities and the region not just your specific home. Um, does anybody want to? Jack. Yeah, so um, the ISO New England uh, latest load forecast shows the, the load in the greater Boston area to be about flat for the next 10 years as a result of a lot of the energy efficiency, the demand resource and such. However, it's still at a level above that that was determined to be the critical load level for the need for this project. So it, the project is not needed based on load growth. It was needed years ago for reliability. And this ISO has been able to operate the system around it. But in terms of planning criteria, it's not meeting its uh, requirements. And that's why the project's needed. Any more questions? Darren, anything from Facebook? Um, yeah, I, I've heard that on the, on the news. I wouldn't think so. I know I've heard it on the news quite a few times. I live south of here, so um, I haven't experienced it myself, but I've heard it on NECN. Um, but yeah, these are all things that we have to factor in when we're, when, when we're engineering a project. We have to look at what's the worst case scenario. What, what are things that could happen? You know, when we're building the overhead transmission lines, we're looking at what is that 100 year super storm? You know, how, how are these towers going to withstand winds over, you know, 60, 70, 80, 120 miles an hour? So we do do this kind of uh, natural event studies. Yes, sir. One last question. Sure. How do you guys keep the vaults dry? Uh, do they, how do they drain out or do they fill up with water? Uh, the short answer is we don't keep the vaults dry. The cables are designed to operate in a wet environment. All right. If there's no more questions, um, I would like to thank everybody for coming and sitting and 
uh, interacting with us, bringing up your concerns, and we will see you in January. Have a wonderful holiday.